Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Shannon Williams from Rancher. I am here with Bill Maxwell. Um, and we are going to be uh, running your training today. So hopefully you, uh, you've joined us with, uh, with lots of questions and some interesting ideas about how you'd like to use Rancher. Um, this is a, uh, this is a, a really informal uh, training. It's meant to be very hands-on with lots of, uh, you know, lots of questions. So just to, to get you started, I just wanted Bill and I to introduce ourselves. So um, I'm Shannon. I'm one of the co-founders here. and I run all of our marketing and engagement with customers. Um, and Bill, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Bill Maxwell. Um, I do a lot of the DevOps, uh, the deployment and kind of automation around running Rancher and then you know, using Rancher you know, for our own stuff. So get to dog food our own products. So. Excellent. And so we are going to be um, today trying to, to spend really uh, about an hour getting you up to speed on some of the basics of how to use Rancher. Um, the things we're specifically going to cover, you know, we'll do a, a, a technical introduction to Rancher. We just want to help you understand, you know, what it does, how it works, you know, how to deploy it, how to set it up, how to configure it. Um, in general, this whole thing is not meant to be a PowerPoint-driven presentation, so we'll be keeping the slides to a minimum. Hopefully, you'll be able to, um, you know, kind of follow along as we use the product to demonstrate, you know, how to set it up, how to use elements like uh, Rancher Compose, you know, how effectively we're using Docker under the, under the hood. Um, the whole thing is going to be based on, on demo, so Bill's going to be um, demonstrating and walking through all of the capabilities of Rancher as we go. And most importantly, um, if you see, you know, here in the GoToMeeting uh, on your sidebar, there's a little question uh, session. So you can post questions, uh, and as you post them, I'll be watching. I'll, I'll stop Bill and interrupt him with any questions, or he'll stop me if I'm, if I'm chatting to make sure we address your questions. So we have small group. These, these trainings are always relatively small. So fire away um, with any questions you have. We, we count to about 20 people, so there, um, you shouldn't have any problem getting your questions answered. Um, so anything... Uh, that you'd like to learn, we won't go away until you learn it. So take your time. Uh, you know, if you're having problems, if you need us to troubleshoot something, you know, we may ask you to hold it till the end of the session after we've gone through the core training. But we'll certainly be happy to troubleshoot any issues you have. And we, you know, we sometimes open up people's lines to walk through um, something that they're doing. But uh, in terms of you know the the real uh, uh, things, I do want to make sure you understand before we leave though is you know, where to find some of the key resources for using Rancher. So in case you haven't uh, been there already, we have a doc site that you can access from our homepage uh, or just go to docs.rancher.com. And there we provide, you know, very detailed and always up-to-date um, documentation about how the product works, how to set it up, um, general concepts about, you know, deploying hosts, deploying containers, um, you know, different approaches like using the CLI, using the UI, using the API. Um, you know, how to manage a Rancher deployment, how to manage applications that you've deployed with Rancher. So all these kind of things we'll cover. And, um, you know, it's a, great, it's a great resource for just troubleshooting if you're, if you're having any problems. Um, the other key resource that we definitely would highly recommend you um, follow on is the, uh, you know, the forums. You know, our, our forums on Rancher.com, you can find them at uh, forums.rancher.com, are constantly monitored by our team of developers and by the community of users, and they are a great place to post any problem you're having. So we tend to see, you know, lots of um, lots of questions. There's a whole Rancher section, so just jump into the Rancher section and fire away with any issue or question that you may be having. You'll find release notes there as we roll out new releases of the product, which tend to come out every you know week to two um, with new features and capabilities as we're going through the beta. And um, it's just a great place to get in touch and learn. People don't ever hesitate to post things in there, um, even if uh, you know it's kind of a uh, you know you feel like it may be a basic question. It's no problem. Just ask it. We'll, we'll definitely jump in and address it as best as possible. So some of the things we're going to cover today, and um, you know we want to make sure we hit all of these over the next hour. We'll talk about how to set up Rancher, deploy it. Um, we'll go through access control, which is an area that's actually changing quite a bit in the product. So talk about how you can connect it to either your LDAP or to um, you maybe GitHub uh, authentication. We'll talk about um, you know, sort of using the, the database that's already there. So how do you want to do access control for Rancher? Then um, we'll talk through the more core functionality, creating environments, uh, managing registries, adding resources and hosts, 
um, you know, using the product's UI and API and CLIs to access the system. We'll go through talking about how to deploy applications and containers. Um, we'll talk through the concepts of stacks and services. We'll introduce the concept of uh, Rancher Compose. And we will, um, you know, we'll go through load balances or load balancing, service discovery, networking. Um, we may briefly touch on storage and snapshots. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to, to answer all of your questions. So feel free to keep uh, posting them and, um, and I'll try to, to bring them up as we go through the session. So anything that we're hitting on, it, it isn't clear to you, fire away a question. Okay, so with that, I want to transition over to Bill, and Bill's going to start by um, by walking through uh, you know, Rancher. You ready, Bill? I am. Thanks. All right. Um, so you are now the presenter. Great. Um, do you see a terminal? I see your terminal. You are you're definitely up with the terminal. Great. And I just made what I wanted to go away. Okay, so. We'll go over kind of installate, uh, installing Rancher. Um, we'll kind of do it step by step, um, and then we'll we'll be installing kind of the single node setup, um, then adding some compute nodes. But we'll talk through kind of some of the the other considerations and authentication mechanisms. So, looking at the docs with the self uh, installing Rancher server, uh, the server is just a single command uh, to get it up and running on a server. Some considerations when bringing it up, though, are if you're going to use LDAP, um, you're going to need to bind mount in the certificate uh, when you create your server. So that's something you got to keep in mind. And then um, by default, Rancher Server has a, a MySQL uh, instance running inside of it, and it uses the database inside there. Um, but that's not a requirement. If you would like, you can configure. Uh, the server to use uh, an external database source, um, or, or if you want to persist that database onto a host volume, um, you can bind mount in a directory into varlib mysql, and that will allow you to um, you know, destroy the rancher server and um, you know, put in a new one in its place without having to rebuild your environment from scratch. Um, or, I mean, if you don't do that up front, it's totally okay. Um, you can just do a Docker volumes from uh, and get the database and be up and running um, um, when you upgrade. And so let's just, I have a couple of hosts. Um, let's bring up the master first. Um, I'm going to assume uh, a familiarity with Docker. Um, this server is going to be our master. It's uh, running um, Docker 1.82, and oops, instead of the Docker group, but um, you can see that we're running Docker 1.82. And so we'll copy and paste that command. And what this says is that we're going to be running. Uh, the Rancher server, this will be the latest image. Um, it'll always restart, so if it crashes for whatever reason, we'll, uh, Docker will try and bring it back up. And we're going to be exposing it on port 8080, um, which will be how we access the UI. And host will access it uh, as well. So we'll bring that up. Docker pulls down the image. So, Bill, while that is un, uh, rolling down, there's a couple questions that came in um, while we were while I was talking. It looks like, and um, I think we can some of these that were asked. I'll try to answer as we're going through because I think we're going to touch on them um, as we're rolling around. But um, one of them was just a, a high-level question about, um, uh, you know, is Rancher will Rancher run on Windows? And I just thought it's a it's a good question to talk about because while we're downloading something, because you know, right now as you saw with this, um, Rancher itself is requires Docker, and Docker today doesn't want to run on Windows. So there are ways to run um, Windows environments and containers, specifically using virtual machines, and we, we did a big uh, session a few months ago, which I'll link to, um, to the person who asked that question, but, you know, fundamentally, you know, typically there are, um, you know, typically 
containers for Windows really are um, are something that's coming in the future. Uh, Microsoft's aggressively pushing it, and they're working about, you know, really closely with, uh, with Docker. So I think within six months, you'll start to see sub container support in Windows, and obviously Rancher will then support it. Um, but for now, by and large, if you want to run Windows environments, um, you're going to want to run them as virtual machines, not as containers. Hopefully that answers your question. How's your download coming? You have time for one more question? Um, yeah, this is the server starting up. We're just watching the logs. Um, at the end of it, you'll see that it'll be listening on port 8080, and we'll jump over to the UI. But um, okay, I great. Think we, we well, while we're doing that, then I'll, I'll ask I'll ask one more question. Um, it was another question about sort of uh, more high-level stuff. And Rancher today is in beta, and the question was, when does Rancher go into real prod mode? Um, so, so Rancher's been in beta now for for about three months. Um, the beta program will probably run another couple months before we um, declare it as GA. During that time, we're continuing to add features and we're continuing to do uh, quality enhancement to Rancher, so a lot of QA work and bug fixes and things like that. Uh, so, you know, before the end of the year, you should see Rancher head to GA, and uh, that'll give you, you know, some feeling on, on, you know, the timing for that. Um, so here we have our, you can see in the logs now, our server is up and listening, and so now if we go to the UI, or go to our web browser, point it to our server on port 8080, you'll see that the UI loads up. Um, yeah, this is the initial welcome screen, it's telling you you don't have any uh, hosts or resources yet, um, and you don't have any services or applications. So the first thing we're going to set up though is authentication. Um, and the way we do that now is we're going to go to the admin section and set up uh, access controls. And here you have uh, three options now. Um, you know, these are, uh, we started with GitHub, so that's that's been around for a long time. Uh, we added LDAP based on customer requests. And if you would like, you can now use uh, Rancher to provide um, you know, kind of its own user management system, although we strongly recommend that um, you use one of these other alternatives, and we'll be adding others as as the product matures. So um, we'll be going and setting up GitHub. There's instructions here. Um, I have my GitHub uh, developer section um, for my personal side. I've got applications and developer applications. If you have an organization, you can create the uh, the application there. And we're registering a new application. This will be our Rancher demo. The homepage URL, you can get that very easily uh, from here. Let me go back, add that here. It's also the callback URL. We'll register. And then take the new client ID and Secret, and then we will authenticate with GitHub. Um, this also uh, supports GitHub Enterprise if you have that in your organization. Okay. So now, um, Rancher will now require a user to uh, log in using their GitHub credentials, and so. Um, you can see that here we've got accounts and users, and um, we can customize the site access. We can add other users, um, oops, add uh, other organizations. I could add my rancher or other um, GitHub users specifically, and then save that authorization, and they'll be able to log in and see my resources uh, in the different environments as we grant access to them. Um, any questions so far on the authentication piece? No, I think you're good. Okay. Good okay. Great. So the next step is to add a host. Um, Actually, there was one question that popped up that I think is somewhat relevant, and it was just a question about running Rancher inside of a proxy, you know, behind a corporate firewall, which is, you know, makes some sense with some of the admin um, questions. So. As, a, as an area we've dealt with quite a bit recently, so maybe you can talk a bit about some of the work we've done there um, while you're showing setup. Yeah, um, 
that's a good point. Um, when you're going to be running either with through a uh, HTTP proxy or if you're going to be running on an air, uh, a network without access to the internet directly, uh, we've been doing some work to support that. Um, in the docs, uh, you can see how to um, configure uh, using an HTTP proxy. Um, it's just uh, some additional parameters on the um, um, on the uh, Rancher container when you're starting it up, um, and Docker. And then if you're going to be running it without any internet access, we've taken some steps recently. Um, all of our uh, binaries and agents are now packaged with the Rancher server container. Um, so when your host register, they'll be able to access those binaries from the Rancher server versus going out to the internet for that. Um, and if you're going to be running there, you do have to run your own private registry. Um, and you have to pull down uh, these three uh, images that we've got. Uh, the Rancher server image needs to be in there, the Rancher agent image needs to be in there, and the agent instance image needs to be in there. Um, you have to put those in your private registry and configure your Docker nodes to use that registry to uh, spin up and register um, to our Rancher server. Um, the last piece is coming, I think, and you should see it in the next week or two. Um, uh, that is the UI. Uh, currently, the UI has to be, have the, the web browser has to have access to the internet to get the UI, and we're fixing that by also shipping the, uh, the UI through the Rancher server container. So you'll be able to deploy a Rancher server instance and um, be able to run it completely detached from the internet provided you um, run a private registry and have your images uh, where you need them. Is that? I think that, I think that totally covers it. Good job. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Um, so we'll start with a custom host, and then we'll use uh, one of these other, we'll use uh, DigitalOcean and add a host there. Um, you know, our host is registered and set up, uh, you know, we're just using HTTP, and uh, we have these, um, you know, the IP address is sort of auto-determined um, based on headers. And so here, uh, when you're creating a host, you can add additional host labels. And so these labels are applied to the host. Um, you can say, uh, you can assign like a role or you can assign, um, you know, some sort of type. Uh, you can manually specify this is going to be large memory. Um, then type for these are completely arbitrary to meet whatever need um, uh, whatever whatever your needs are um, to you know, these rules as you apply them here um, and they can be applied after the fact um, as they're applied to the host you can then use them to make scheduling decisions when you create um, uh, stacks and services um, you can say you know this stack needs these types of, only put these uh, services on hosts with this type of label, or you know, only put one uh, of these containers on the hosts with this type of label. Um, so you can apply them uh, either at the creation time or after the fact, um, you can show that later. So I have another agent host over here, and we'll just copy and paste that command um, and get it register a node. Um, one thing to consider is if you're running Rancher on uh, a single server and you're going to have the server and an agent on the same uh, host, you'll want to add an additional parameter. You'll copy and paste the command, but before you run it, you want to add a dash E um, cattle agent IP equals and then the public IP address of the host before starting it. Um, and what that does is it um, tells the agent to use that IP specifically. Um, we do our best to guess what the public IP address is of the host, um, but when they're on the same, it ends up using the Docker bridge, and so then none of your other nodes can connect to the node that's running the server. So just something to consider if you're going to be running in that type of setup. And so we've run that command, and if we go back to hosts, we now see that I have a uh, new machine connected, and I can see its CPU and memory utilization. 
Um, if it had any labels applied to it, we could see what those are and some basic uh, host information uh, regarding that. And so one of the other things that we've added um, is the ability to use, uh, we've created a service using Docker Machine um, to go out and create uh, Docker hosts for us. And so we can show that now. It uses Amazon and Exascale packet. Um, but we use DigitalOcean for now, and we'll just do visual training demo. Have to put our name in there so we know what they're for later on. Um, and then we'll copy our access token. And so we'll just pick a, kind of the defaults here and tell it to create. And again, you can add a host label um, at the time of creation if you want to do that now, or you're just going to add host and later decide, you know, oh, I'll use this one for that, or you can totally change that after the fact. So here it's creating um, that node. And this takes a few minutes. Uh, Shannon, is there some questions that we want to field now, or you know, I think uh, I think there was a couple, there was a couple there's a question that is probably worth chatting a little bit. There's a couple questions about uh, using Compose, um, which I'm going to hold until we get to to that. But there was a question about Rancher OS that came up, which um, kind of relates to as we deploy these nodes. So someone was asking, what is Rancher OS? How is it related to Rancher? And uh, just, you know, so let me talk about that for just a minute. I mean, Rancher OS is a separate project. Um, from Rancher. So Rancher OS is a micro Linux distribution that is uh, it's like about 20 megabytes and it's a, it's a Linux distribution that from the ground up is written to run Docker. Um, and so what that means is it runs Docker as uh, PID1, the first process that gets booted after the kernel starts, and all of the effectively all of the system services from your console um, to UDEV to whatever it is that you're running on that Linux host run as uh, system services. So it's a really great tiny operating system for running Linux and, and that's useful because generally when you're running containers you run most of the configuration in the container. You don't need a lot in the, the Linux. Department. So the, the less you put in there the better in terms of how often it needs to be upgraded and how much weight it has on the host. Um, in terms of how it works with Rancher uh, though it's really orthogonal. So um, you can certainly run Rancher OS as the host to run Rancher or as the host for any of these infrastructure nodes that Bill is creating on different clouds. Um, but that's, you know, that's really optional. You can use any Linux uh, uh, OS as long as it supports um, you know, Docker 1.6 or later to run uh, Rancher or to run as these nodes. So if you're using RHEL or Ubuntu, or CentOS or CoreOS or anything else that is your option of choice, um, you're, you're certainly welcome to continue using that. So Rancher OS is a, is a great thing um, if you're trying to decide on you know, what type of Linux OS you want to use for running Docker containers because it has a lot of unique advantages. But in terms of using Rancher, it's really it's certainly not required. And it's, um, it's an optional thing that you may, may choose to use if you're, if you're looking for uh, a different Linux OS. But if your organization is always uses RHEL, that's what's approved. Certainly can continue doing that. So hopefully that answers the question about what is Rancher OS and how, how is it related to that. Um, do we have time for one more question now, or can That's I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So while while this is booting up, I'll, I'll I'll address. There was another question that sort of asked, how does Rancher compare with uh, other tools like Mesos, Kubernetes, and and other things that are in the market for, um, you know, in the Docker ecosystem and. Uh, you know, from our perspective, Mesos and Kubernetes are actually both pretty different um, already. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them. But we see Rancher conceptually as a platform for running um, what we call a container service, and that container service is typically deployed for an organization or part of a, a you know a cloud service or a SaaS or something as the management platform for managing Docker environments, deploying applications, managing hosts and resources, but importantly for delivering um, infrastructure services that are consistent because in this infrastructure in this environment that Bill's creating and one of the stuff you'll start to see is that Rancher manages the networking manages the host manages load balancing service discovery um, and so we sort of we see different tools as 
is sort of filling different components. So we um, we often work with people who are using Mesos, so that um, because Mesos turns out to be a really good way to manage bare metal infrastructure. And so in a lot of cases, uh, ranchers running on top of something like Mesos, which might be a um, an automation system sitting on top of uh, a data center. Um, so you know there is you know Mesos can be used to manage containers directly, but if you're moving it for container management, um, you know, there it would overlap a little bit with Rancher. But it's a very different type of system. It really doesn't deal with things like multi-tenancy and running different types of uh, you know, container implementations, running Docker Compose with, with networking and service discovery, and a lot of things that, that Rancher does. So a lot of times we, we tend to run on top of Mesa. And um, Kubernetes is another one to think about. Uh, you, you know, we see Kubernetes as being really an alternative to Docker Compose and Swarm, so another way to describe your application and then run that application. And um, you know, from that perspective, we're actually working really closely um, with the team developing Kubernetes at Google and, and elsewhere to actually support Kubernetes in an upcoming release of Rancher. So right now, when you deploy applications, you'll see we everything is done using Docker Compose and Docker Swarm. But um, in the future, you'll be able to, uh, if you want to, in an environment, you'll be able to deploy a Kubernetes uh, cluster and deploy a Kubernetes application um, directly from within Rancher. So Kubernetes and Docker Compose are somewhat um, alternatives for describing your application. We'll be able to let you pick whichever you want to use inside of one of these environments and deploy it. So when we show you how we manage Compose environments and, and um, scheduling Compose services and things like that, um, you can you can really see a lot of uh, how we would also support Kubernetes in, in a very similar approach. So hopefully that helps you understand, you know, how Rancher makes those Kubernetes, Docker Compose, all sort of fit together in this space. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of a lot of these things can work together. A lot of them have some pieces of overlap. So it does, you know, usually is worth um, playing with different tools and figuring out which ones make sense for you. But um, we see a lot of people using some combination of these. Um, and, and that goes all the way through to Docker Swarm, which someone else asked about. Um, Docker Swarm is definitely another, uh, you know, another platform that is, is really just part of how to schedule um, the resources on clusters. So today, Rancher is supports um, uh, scheduling natively. So we just do scheduling um, ourselves using affinity policies, which, which uh, Bill is going to show you. But um, as Swarm matures, it's still, it's still pretty new. As Swarm matures, we'll be supporting Swarm directly within Rancher as well. So Swarm uh, becomes a, a, you know, a really useful scheduling tool, you'll be able to use that as well. Um, there was another question about, about getting support for Rancher. So Rancher is open source software. Anyone can use it, deploy it. Um, but as, uh, as you're deploying it, if you ever need support or consulting services or need someone to help you implement it, um, these are all things that we do here at Rancher Labs. So we, we provide enterprise support uh, for Rancher. We also provide consulting services and integration services to help people get started with building their own container stack. So hopefully that gives you um, gives you an idea of uh, you know how to work with us if you're interested. Okay, Bill, I think we're we're good to go. Do you want to jump forward? Um, so I just was cloning this and oh, it came online. Uh, just so we have three nodes, but um, yeah. So let's get started. So first thing we'll do is um, just create a simple um, container through kind of the, the direct approach of saying I want this container to be here where the user is the scheduler. Um, so we'll just use the ghost template for some of our simpler demonstrations and then I think for the more complex uh, setup using Rancher Compose we'll use um, Elasticsearch for fun. So we'll just call this ghost direct we we'll use the ghost image, and we're just using this straight off of Docker Hub. It uses port 2368, so we'll we'll kind of map that. We'll say that we're going to map a port, and we'll say 8081 to 2368. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, this is pretty much the basics and the simplest way to create a container, um, but we do expose a lot of the configuration options uh, for Docker, so you can run it with, you know, dash IT, uh, non-interactive. You can specify the command, override the entry point, um, the user to run as, add additional environment variables, 
Um, we support volumes, and volumes from, um, networking, you can link, you can uh, create services, um, you can add hosts, help check, security, we can run it in piv uh, privilege mode or you can run the PID mode, um, add different capabilities, add labels to the container, and also making um, scheduling decisions. But for now, we'll just create this little container. And what you see happening here is on the first container that gets created on a node, we start up our network agent. Um, and that handles uh, running um, the the way we do our overlay networking, that container sort of facilitates and um, sets that all up for us. So on your first containers, you'll um, end up having a little bit longer startup time as it also pulls down these uh, network agents. Okay, so that's up. And then we should be able to see that we're creating Kind of gives you a real-time update so that you can see that it's downloading the image and doing the extracting kind of each layer. Um, it updates. And when it's done and up and running, we'll be able to go to this IP address on port 8081, and we should see Ghost. And we do. So another there. cool... Yeah, there it was. So another cool feature of... Um, Rancher that's kind of fun is if you've already got tools that you use um, to provision Docker and you install Rancher, you kind of get this added benefit of being able to um, run native Docker commands. So we'll run pretty much the same thing um, on a different port this time. We'll do 8082 on the 2368 and we'll run the ghost image again. And so here, we spin that container up, and now you see it actually popping up in the UI. And we um, apply our networking to it. And so now if we go to the same IP address, but port 8082, we see more ghosts. So, yeah, just kind of a neat feature. So if you were provisioning with like an Ansible, Puppet Chef, um, or some other tool, um, you know, Rancher kind of is still able to detect that you've done that and um, you know, apply its overlay networking and, and wire those uh, configurations up for you. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so we'll just kind of get rid of those for now. Um, pro tip, uh, normally when you press delete, it'll tell you confirm, but if you want to skip that, you just hold the uh, command key. And so now what we'll do is we will um, start this up as uh, a service. So we'll just call this our ghost service. It looks essentially the same as creating a normal um, container. Um, we'll set up our port map so that 8081 goes to 2368. Um, you know, if there was other services, we could link them. We have the same set of options. Um, you can set this here. So we'll say set ghost version. We'll say this is just version one. Um, and then create. So here we're creating, we'll go out a little bit further. So by default, there's a default stack. Um, and each stack sort of represents a collection of services. Um, and so within that stack, uh, we have our first service, which is the ghost service. And so it starts inactive, but it's configured, so now we can start that up. You can see here, we're spinning up this container. And if you want to see over the infrastructure view, this time and put it on this DigitalOcean host. So it'll take a second. Hey, 
There was a, there was a question while you were um, doing that, Bill, about uh, what what the browser is actually connecting to. So is the browser running on the host, or um, is the container accessible? Sorry, I'm trying to understand the question. Is the container accessible with this IP from outside the host? How do you how do you access that? So maybe you could just talk about sort of the connections between you know, the browser, the server, and the um, the agent running on the host, as well as the containers. Maybe just talk through how the networking is happening, so that you're able to view the log of these uh, nodes and and everything. Yeah. Um, so Rancher Server exposes uh, an API, and the uh, web UI is a client side application. So the browser um, is uh, is connecting to that API, but running primarily on in the browser. Um, the nodes, each agent, when it connects and you register it um, and creates a, uh, a connection um, to the Rancher server, um, it's got a WebSocket connection um, that it uses to get events from the Rancher server and, um, and also um, exposes uh, the like the Docker logs and the, um, if you're going to create a shell, uh, it, it exposes kind of that connection point. And so um, that kind of gives you a centralized target to send all your nodes to and kind of um, limits the scope of what you need to expose. Um, and it's an outbound connection, so, you know, if you're running, um, you know, it's, it's easier to connect to a server that's some, in a, a public location versus, you know, and your nodes don't have to be, or they can be on a different network um, as long as they can connect to the server. That also makes it easier for us when we do SSL termination that you would only need a single certificate um, to talk to the, there's a small proxy that runs inside there for WebSockets, and so you only need one certificate to kind of secure that, that connection point. Um, and so then the browsers talk talking to that, and then for connections like this, where we talk to view logs, the browser creates a WebSocket connection um, you know, to the proxy, and so does the host, and they sort of just kind of get mucks together um, so that they can communicate, and so we can see the logs coming from the host. And then, um, Yeah, the UI itself has actually also got a long uh, WebSocket connection to the Rancher server, and it's getting event updates, and that's how you see the application updating as things are happening. Got it. There was also, um, I, the person kind of clarified their question. They were accessing, uh, ac it was about how to access the Ghost app on the browser. So, oh, how did you expose the Ghost app on the browser to, uh, you know, so that you could, you could access it? Sorry, I went to... Long tangent there. Um, so <laughs> these, <laughs> these nodes, um, so the, the containers themselves are are leveraging um, um, just kind of the normal port forwarding that that Docker sort of does with the publish and expose. Um, so this container uh, exposes port twenty three sixty eight. And we're kind of mapping it to 8081 or 8082. Um, and so in traditional Docker uh, setups, Docker actually manages that firewall connection. And so, um, which is great. But when you use um, Rancher, we actually manage that firewall. So when you do a Docker um, PS, you won't actually see the ports listed uh, in, the, in the output for that. But uh, if you look at uh, your IP tables rules, you'll see, uh, particularly the NAT table, you'll see the, the rules are created. And that's sort of what the, that's the role and purpose of the network agent there. And so in order to actually communicate with the host, we have, um, uh, I believe we just kind of have a wide open security policies on it. Um, and so that it, you know, we can, essentially deploy anything we want to um, and have that exposed, but the, you know, in an actual production setup, you wouldn't probably do that, and you would have um, either security groups applied to the host and sort of need to know that a little bit uh, ahead of time before making those 
uh, scheduling decisions, but um, I think you can, as you, this approach is more, you know, kind of ad hoc, but when you start getting into Compose and managing that, um, you know, it, you can map them there from that perspective. So, hopefully clarify. Right. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. And so now as a service, um, we have our Ghost container. And we can add more. Let's do that just to kind of get this, this one to have a network agent um, up and running. And one, just the third, so we get one on the other host. And so, did it actually take that click? Yep. And so, let's clone this service. Uh, we'll call this ghost2, and we'll change the port. 882, and this time, um, we can make scheduling decisions that says the host must or must not have a host label. See if we'd specify labels on the host, or if we'd specify labels, uh, we can look at container labels or services. Um, or containers with a specific name. I think we put, um, where we put, we said version one, so we'll make this one version two. And what we'll say is that must not have a container with label ghost version one. So let's just create that. So that's coming up online. We technically have a scale of three. But it hasn't tried to do that yet. Oh, it did. So here we have three hosts. And so if we go to activate this service now, you say start, what we'll end up in is actually a loop because now the host, every host right now has a container with version one on it. But if we were to stop that service, we should be able to find a placement this time. We have to actually purge them. So yeah, this time we ended up with our ghost too. So, um, so you can kind of create these affinity, anti-affinity rules based on kind of what's going on there. And um, you know, for safety reasons, you might want to basically say don't put these two versions if they share like a common volume or they're going to do something where they just should, for availability purposes, should just never be on the same host and that's a failure domain. Um, you can kind of control that. Um, so that is a kind of a basic application there. Um, but let's, here you kind of get kind of a couple different views. You can see you know, the services, these aren't too interesting as they're not really connected or communicating with each other, but um, you know, they exist uh, and you can kind of see that graph view. And then here is the um, Rancher Compose version of this. Um, and so we could actually download this file. Export the config. Um, actually, I'm going to need to set up a few things. So 
Before we move on from the UI pieces of this to the Ranger Compose side of it, is there, are there any questions around, around this part of it as I set up the API? So here we're just going to create an API key. Hey Bill, you were asking if there are any questions. I think I was um, I was talking into my mute button, but uh, there was ah. one question actually that uh, um, was about you know how how using existing Rancher slash Docker compose files and importing it into Rancher. So um, you know it's not necessarily obvious from the UI, but um, with Rancher to launch new Compose uh, files, you do it from the CLI. So the CLI allows you to call to, uh, you know, an external um, Compose or uh, uh, Compose file and deploy it. We are adding that into the UI. So in the in the next few um, next few releases, you'll see the ability to start importing uh, Rancher slash Docker Compose uh, uh, environments into. Uh, into Rancher's UI and deploying them from the UI. We're also adding a library to allow you to maintain these and share them with other people. So you'll have kind of a composed library as part of Rancher. But hopefully that kind of explains how to use it. So maybe though, as you're using it, um, uh, you can you can show the CLI and stuff now. So uh, there was a question: Does the CLI exist for Rancher config now? Um, so the CLI allows you the CLI. Maybe did you show how to download the CLI from the UI? Yeah. Bill and where uh, get it? So here up in the upper right hand corner of the UI, there's the ability to download it for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, you just click it, and it'll download. You unzip it, and um, you have access to Ranger Compose. Did so you want to? Yeah. So as you're going through. And deploying this, you know, maybe just uh, show how you might use an external Compose environment you've already created and, and launch it on Rancher as a new sure. stack. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I will definitely do that, but um, I just want to show that you know you can download the config and sort of reuse it. Um, so we're going to say let's create Ghost two because that was some sort of update. E3, and so you can say Rancher Compose this Project uh, Dev Ghost, um, and say Up Ghost 2. That was the name. Yes. So Up Ghost 2, and we'll see in the UI now that we've added a new stack for Dev Ghost, and we are creating the containers. Um, and they have all of the same uh, specified rules and everything else. Um, and then all the logs end up coming here, so we can see that each one of these containers started up. And it's very similar to Rancher Compose, except when I press Control C here with Rancher Compose, those containers don't disappear. Um, so that's um, kind of the ability to export and re-import kind of uh, a Compose. You can do hand edits. You could have added additional services. Um, anything you needed to uh, to work with that. And so let's show a bit more of a complicated example. Um, uh, and here we'll bring up um, the Elasticsearch application. Um, just to quickly look at it, this is just a Docker Compose file. Um, it does make use of, it is designed to run on Rancher, but this we would run um, natively with just Docker um, without any issue. And so here what we're using is we're using a couple of um, kind of advanced concepts uh, you know, for, for containers. And so um, Rancher has this concept of a sidekick, um, which is uh, a service can have other containers that need to be scheduled with it. Um, kind of when you make the scheduling decision need to be considered kind of as a whole unit. This is very similar to kind of Kubernetes pod concept if, if you looked at some of the other suites out there. Um, but you know, if you need something to share like a volume or a network namespace or um, 
you know, a pit namespace, then you would want to schedule, you would want to make it a sidekick. Um, the way you do that is you add a label to uh, the service, um, these IO Rancher sidekicks, and then you specify the other service to make a sidekick. So with these Rancher or Elasticsearch master containers, I have a conf master, which is um, a container running uh, confd, which is a nice uh, lightweight um, configuration management tool kind of for containers. Talks to key value stores. It's got several different backends. Um, we're going to be adding support for the Rancher metadata um, backend as well. So you'll be able to query um, the Rancher's metadata service for information about the container and the service and the stack that it's in and uh, build configurations from that. Um, and so this application, we're going to be building an Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, it's got um, the three different types of roles for Elasticsearch, which are a master, which keeps track of all of the um, all the data, where the shards are in the, uh, the cluster, then the data nodes, which store all of the information and documents, and then the clients, the, which um, are the, uh, the access points for you know, your other tools like Kibana or Logstash or you know, where you would actually connect to for your application. And we're also going to deploy this other container called COPF, which is a nice little management tool for uh, Elasticsearch. It allows you to look at the different nodes and see, kind of get like a high-level overview of your, your general cluster health and, and your indexes. And so with that, we will do Rancher uh, Compose up. Uh, we'll do this minus P, yes, up. And so here, we should start seeing our new ES service, and it brings up the uh, master container. You'll see that it'll actually bring up two containers. Um, one of them is the configuration container, and then the other is going to be the actual application container. And if we look at the infrastructure side of things, you can see that these uh, containers are being scheduled on the same host. Um, and this is because they're going to be sharing a volume. Uh, the configuration uh, for the application will come from uh, the conf storage. So we see as the service comes up, the logs start feeding back. Uh, we can see that you know, we're now an Elasticsearch node. And then the other containers are also being spun up. And if you look, um, you can see that the sidekick, you know, this is the client's con configuration, and that the client is now, um, you know, and then the application is being serviced uh, by that. All right. So that's coming up. And it's coming up pretty quickly. Um, typically, uh, you wouldn't want to run Elasticsearch this way. This is running between clouds. Um, this box here is in Google, and these other two we created in DigitalOcean. So you probably normally don't want to introduce um, that much latency. Um, and in hindsight, could have shown a, this would have been a good example for uh, for labels. We could have said you know deploy them you know in the same cloud. But okay, so the services have come up, and now we're deploying this uh, cloud server. Let's see this container as it's coming up. It's now active, so we'll go to this host. Here we get a nice, hopefully a nice UI version. We're seeing the clients. There they are. There we go. Now we have our our three nodes are up and running. Um, this particular cluster is now spanning clouds. Um, and, and we can, now that that's up and running, we can say scale uh, elastic search data nodes. It's currently at one, so we'll tell it to go to two. Now 
if we watch this, we should see a new node popping up here. Make it the host. Looks like it's up. And so now we have four nodes. So you can kind of control the scale. Um, you know, this is a good application um, that you could say, you know, if you were to launch the data nodes, you would say, you know, these boxes have a lot of memory and large hard drives, so only schedule data nodes here, and then put anti-affinity rules on the other roles that say don't launch in the same spot as those. Um, but you know, at a high level, that gives us the uh, kind of a more complicated app. And if we look at the graph view of it, you can see how they're all wired together. We've got our COP container, which is talking to our Elasticsearch clients, and then we've got our clients and our data nodes talking to the master. And the reason we're doing that for now is um, you get this, um, uh, it has unicast discovery, and so when they connect, they share each other, all the other client information with them, and so they're able to you now talk to each other. And that communication actually happens over um, our overlay network. Um, so we do IPsec tunnels between the nodes. Um, so that way you know, your traffic's protected and not going over the open internet. And so that's kind of what I've got for uh, our complicated application deployment. Um, yeah, any, any questions? I don't, I don't think there's any questions right now. I think we're good. We're kind of running up on the hour. Um, I know we've covered a number of things um, that, uh, that, you know, from how to deploy an application, how to deploy, um, you know, an entire stack. Um, so hopefully we've covered most of the key content as we're, as we're kind of running out of time. Um, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to cover, Bill, before we, before we start wrapping up? Um, no, I, I think this is... This gives you a pretty good overview, I think. Um, but if there's any questions, well, no, they, yeah, I think um, we, you know, we always have lots more questions as they come in. But what, um, you know, what we, you know, if you have any other questions you'd like to, um, you'd like to have us, us answer, we're certainly happy to do that before we wrap up. Otherwise, um, you know, the key for for you know getting going with um, with Rancher is really um, is really just you know kind of trial and error. If you need to get use it, read the docs, and if you need help, definitely hit the forum. Um, but one thing to consider if you're trying to do you know, if you're trying to do some specific things, you may find a lot of helpful um, advice using uh, just going through our blogs. You'll see just many um, explanations, walkthroughs, how to deploy all sorts of things from monitoring tools, um, you know, how to monitor container environments, how to do logging with containers. How to you know um, use containers to do upgrades, um, you know how to do rolling upgrades of applications. You'll see a lot of this defined uh, in blogs that are all possible and uh, you know relatively easy things to do um, here. One of the things that we didn't really show you in this is kind of uh, the the load balancing capability. Uh, maybe before we go, we just show um, show how to set up a load balancer for for your Ghost cluster. Um, uh, uh, build. Do you think that would be a? I think that'd be a useful thing for a lot of people to, to understand because it is one of the cooler things you can do with Rancher right off the bat. Yeah. So if we wanted to load balance our, you know, our, our goes to service, we would uh, go to the stack and add a load balancer. Um, call it ghost lb, and then so. When you're talking about scale and the load balancer, um, typically you can run one and that'll create one instance of the load balancer, but if you wanted to deploy multiple and then do like a round robin DNS or some other service above it to kind of load balance across the load balancers, you could do that. Um, and so we're going to have this listening on port 80. Then we'll go over HTTP and we'll have it be going to it was 80, 82. Or actually, we can just make that more simple. Just say we're going to link it to the Ghost 2 service. Um, and say, uh, port 80 to 8082. Um, we have added SSL termination. 
Um, in order to leverage that, you would need to um, have previously set up a um, SSL certificate, and you do that in the infrastructure tab, and you would just add your certificate, your private key, and your certificate in your search chains. Um, that would allow you to uh, do SSL termination on these load balancers. You would create this, and then uh, back here, you would be able to you know, select that cert uh, from there and, and also wire up the uh, SSL. So what we'll do here is create that. And we'll start it. So you see we have a new container, the LB agent. Um, you can get the public IP of it. And then if all is working, you should be able to go here and hit uh, get a 503. Um, I'm guessing maybe we might have guessed the port wrong. Um, so Rancher is driven completely by an API, and if you want to, if you're curious about what's happening with that, um, you can go take a look at that. Was it easy to? So, it looks like you have it pointing to port eighty instead of the uh, the ghost port, which is like twenty three something. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. I'm not pointing it to the host. You're right. You're not pointing it to the right, the right, the right port on the host. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that sounds right. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I am. Um, right. Three sixty eight. We had originally exposed the um, the ghost containers on port 8082, which is why I did that. But since I'm actually you end up linking these to the container, you actually don't need to expose these out. The you don't need to expose the port to the host. You could just use the load balancer, and um, you can control like where the load balancer uh, containers would get scheduled by adding host labels and then controlling security groups there. Um, and then it would use the rancher overlay network to communicate to the other nodes so they wouldn't actually have to be exposed to the internet. Um, well, let's catch that chat. Use a unique name. We'll activate it. You may not have a pre IP address either if so if you've got the other one running or not. Right, yeah. right, so now if we go. Yeah, that was it. Well, yes. good thing you got me here to troubleshoot for you, Bill. All right. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do all of this. Um, and thanks everyone for attending today's session. Um, it, it hopefully this gives you a good idea how to get started. Um, we'll try to record today. We've recorded this. We'll try to post this on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and look up Rancher. Um, you can uh, you can find this recording and you'll be able to uh, to go in and uh, watch it again if you want to see any of this. Also, you know, hit our forums up or if you ever need any help, you can always send an email to, um, uh, to beta uh, at rancher.com. Um, and, and we'll we'll help you from there as well. So thank you all very much for attending today's meetup, and good luck with your deployment. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you, Bill.